Welcome to Blending the Family, the podcast. Topics can range from dads hitting rock bottom, daughters watching their parents divorce, or even what's a good wine for couples to have while talking about finances. Here's your host, whose Facebook likes are actually a negative number, Tommy Maloney. Welcome to another episode of Blending the Family, the podcast. I am your host, Tommy Maloney, coming to you live or recorded, I guess you should say. I am in Colorado Springs, Colorado, and the temperature right now is a sunny, sunny 34 degrees. I want to get this intro done because I want to go and enjoy a nice walk in Colorado Springs. We're up here for hockey, hockey, and hockey. All right, on this episode, I am still dumbfounded. Did I interview the guest or the guest interview me? Max Noble is on the podcast. He has a LinkedIn video show called Hashtag, I'm going to mention the hashtag, Share Your Wisdom with Max Noble. Max Noble is out of Denmark, and I have to mention that because I'm an ignorant American and I don't know time zones, especially European time zones. I know United States time zones, didn't know time zones, Europe, and Max educated me on that because we had to record like 7 in the morning uh, mountain time, which was like, I think, 7 p.m. his time. But anyway, it worked out great. Max is an author, a speaker, uh, just full of energy. Like I said, he has a LinkedIn video show. And I found out about his show from a previous guest, Marcus Aurelius Anderson, who was actually on Max's very first LinkedIn show. And I had, to, I had to get Max on the show, and here we are. Max is a co-author of the book Journey to Success. You can find it on Amazon. He also has a new book out called The Laws of First Impression, and that's where um, Max's niche is. He's uh, a, a speaker and a coach on dealing with first impressions. I have to. So one of the things I want to tell you about about uh, this episode, Max talks about a journey he made on a train to a mountain. And for me personally, I want and I'm not going to give away anything, but I wanted him to acknowledge if this was a spiritual awakening because I'm going for my own um, finding my faith, and and this is where my my wife Anne has really helped me with that and with max again i really wanted to hear how this this train ride to this mountain changed his life and so i hope you enjoy this episode because that's all i'm going to mention please go to uh find max on linkedin max noble you know you won't be disappointed thanks for uh listening thanks for downloading i hope you have a great day And I hope where you are right now, it is sunny, where you can get out, go for a walk, because that's what I want to go do. Nothing personal. I'd love to hang out with you even more, but I want to take advantage of this gorgeous mountain weather where it's sunny, not snowing. I mean, heck, I'm, I'm looking outside right now to a courtyard where they have an outdoor swimming pool, and it's covered. It has a cover on it. And it shouldn't be because it's still it's still gorgeous out. We should be out there swimming. Or or not. I don't know. All right. Have a great day. Thanks for tuning in. Thanks for listening. Thanks for sharing, caring, and um, pairing your wines with really good cheeseburgers. Yeah, but you look good. Yeah, thank you, sir. Thank You're you, welcome. sir. So um, as I've been kind of, you and I have been emailing back and forth. I don't know who's interviewing who for whose show. And this is super exciting for me, Max, because, number one, I love your LinkedIn show. You've got a great Thank energy. You. And, of course, the top hat. Uh, I don't know any other hosts that have a top hat, especially in this modern day. Um, so how did – how did uh, I'm, gonna, I'm just going to dive right in, Max, and say – Listen, you yeah. do just – I know that you will excel in it, and I will learn from you, and then I will use against you, all right? <laughs> how how did the LinkedIn show start, Max? I'm uh, I'm diving in, Max. I'm diving in. Let's dive in. Let's do the stuff. Let's have a good time. So how did the LinkedIn show start? 
He was a random act of uh, it was an act of random incidents. Basically, I started to experiment with um, interviewing interesting people. Uh, I was writing my book. Uh, then it was called the loss of the first impression. Now it is called the impression. So the impression book it is about the first impressions, and um, I contacted the most interesting people I could find from LinkedIn and said, "Hey, listen, I'm writing this book. Would you like to be interviewed?" Right? Okay. And most of them said, "Wow, that sounds great. I want to be part of it." You know. Um, and then what happened was that I needed a <laughs> this sounds a little bit crazy, but <laughs> I needed a recording program. And I was like, all right, this co they say everybody this is a good program. And that was 30 bucks. And I basically just installed it just before I was going to interview the number one the world uh, in body language. Okay. Bowden. And... Um, all of a sudden, I could see that he was actually recording the the video too. It was like, wow, this is interesting. And I didn't have really, you know, I look horrible. You know, I didn't have any of this what I now have. The whole, I had lights here and I have a top hat, and you know, I was looking actually like this that moment. You know, and was, everything was wrong from my side. That's why you never see that clip. But from that point, I knew that there was something interesting that no one else wasn't really doing as I was doing it. So, Mark Bowden, the number one in body language, I recorded without him knowing me. Uh, the whole interview, and then I just decided, all right, this is interesting. But then that was like a few months ago. That was a few months ago, and by then there wasn't really yet anything in LinkedIn that you could upload directly. It was just linking things there, you know, pages and so. And then I think it was in August they opened for for um, for a direct uploads. Right. So we have actually a show. My first idea was like, hey, I got so much good footage here. I got great interviews, great people, and now I have actually I have all these connections. And I can tag them, and I can promote them, and of course get people to follow me. And having some really great contact, then I just, you know, my wife was like, "What are you doing? I mean, why?" You know, all of a sudden I was in basement. You know, this is actually not really a basement, but you can see it's just, you know, uh, I was and, here, and I was like, you know, I need to learn to edit this stuff. And but where where are you, Max? I am in Denmark. Um, just uh, 30 kilometers north from Copenhagen. Okay. Yeah, it's old town. We have beautiful castle. Uh, it's called Hiljokon. Sounds awful, but that's the city I live in. And, but I travel a lot, as you can see also from my video footage. And that's what I love about my life. I'm free bird. I am one of those uh, really few people on earth who sort of do this lifestyle where I don't feel that I have the limitations. Of course, I have the not family, but this is chosen. I love my family, but otherwise, I don't have the normal limitations from eight to five work. Or, or I'm also learning to not to have um, how would I say wishes or expectations. I had a great interview last night with the. Uh, he used to be a, a professor in um, in Copenhagen, but now he's Buddhist monk. 16th year in in Sri Lanka, living alone on top of a mountain. Wow! Um, but we had we had a really, really this fantastic conversation about what matters in life, and I have sort of moved from being this slave of cultural uh, codex or you know sort of codex where where we we need to behave like everybody else to. I don't really care that much. I'm just me. But you know, is that to... is, is that and it's sorry to interrupt, Max, but yeah. is that you or is it more of a Danish culture with that free bird uh, type attitude? No. 
in this meme because in Denmark we have what is called Yantelo. And it means that everybody should behave like everybody else. Okay. Uh, it is very tight. It is probably one of the tightest cultures in the world that, you know, we respect each other. We almost to a certain degree we love each other. The foreigner we like strangers too, but we are expecting that everybody behaves like everybody else. So individualism is like almost taboo in in Denmark. Uh, the same way in in Finland. In Finland, we have this little bit more independent spirit, but we are still sort of part of the Nordic culture, where we are tied to each other and uh, expressing yourself in uh, in um, unconventional way. Ways is seen strange and uh, not really acceptable. So I have grown to be, I have forced myself to become this explorer, uh, old-fashioned cosmopolitan, uh, where I sort of put my own rules and and uh, my own values in, in place. So I'm just exper- experimenting with life. What what's, uh, what's one rule that you go by that others just look at you and go, Max, no? Th- there's this... Uh, I don't know if there anyone else who has been quoted before about this, but most likely there is. But my own quote is that uh, to live the life fullest and die empty. I like that. Uh, live the life fullest and die empty. Yeah. So I want to experience the life to the fullest and die empty. So when I die one day, hopefully not too soon, um, I want to feel empty i have given everything Mm -hmm. i have most likely i will not experience everything because i still have my limitations to a certain extent but i will have this feeling that it was a worthy life i gave enough i gained wisdom enough to give enough and i can now go so what what was that aha moment max that you 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 want to have a different life than others and uh, within your circle. And what was that moment like where you said, you know what? I, I don't want to be like everybody else. I don't want to be a lemming. I want to, you know, live the Max Noble way. And there, I mean, there's the, the, the boring version of it. I, I, I've been always like that, which is, there's no really tagline, line, but there's a, there was a culmination, uh, which is actually my whole short story in that book, what was just published, um, Journeys to Success. Uh, the whole so- short story is about this moment, uh, two-day period, where I experienced something really almost like enlightenment, mm-hmm. where I was a young boy, I think it was 19 or so. I didn't have a, enough experience to to sort of protect myself. I was just jumping into the line, you know, like doing all the crazy stuff without thinking of consequences. And um, when there was, a, the story goes like this. I was living in Helsinki, which is the capital of Finland about that time. And um, I had free time. And I decided, all right, I don't know where I want to go. I just go to the train station, take the first train. I took the first train. It was going to uh, north, at most north uh, train station in Finland. And I was like, that sounds great. I looked from the looked from the um, weather forecast, saying that all right, there's sunshine there. All right, I go there. So, and then from from Rovaniemi, where I end up, I saw that or right, there's a bus that goes even three, four hundred more north. Uh, and I was like, well, I've never been that north there. So I take that bus and I end up there and uh, I sleep in the bus. I fell asleep in the bus. And when I wake up, I see this amazing mountain, which is one of the highest peaks in Finland, just, just rising up from me. And it was early June, and there was still about major snow everywhere. And um, 
I look at the man, I was like all fascinated about it. You know, what? you know, I didn't, I didn't know why. And I went to close by bed and breakfast. I slept and I, I dreamed about the mountain. And it's like, all right, I'm gonna conquer it. The first thought, thought when I woke up was, I'm gonna conquer it. I'm gonna take the that top top now. And there was no plan. I just ate well, rented some skis to get to the plateau, and um, and started skiing. And um, I climbed it. I don't know how I managed. It's very very steep mountain, and there's a lot of snow. But I was only 50 meters from the top when the first avalanche launched. Hold on, you uh, first avalanche? First avalanche. Wow. And it was just like half a meter from me down. And I was like, the first was this fascination because when this sort of sea of snow starts to move, it, it looks like innocent because white and to start with doesn't make that much noise, but things just grew like this, I don't know, several hundred meters wide sea pushing downwards and then just crash some, you know, reach the, the tree level and crash some trees. And I can still hear the voices, the cracking noises. And and, uh, and then I just realized I'm gonna, you know, this is, this was stupid. <laughs> <laughs> this was stupid because I mean, I've never, I've never climbed a mountain. And this was something that really like, I was like, all right, I froze. I completely froze because that was my first reaction, all right? That was an avalanche. And second thought was like, okay, es escape from it. But I could see that it went even more steep, the mountain. To the, to the top. So uh, there would be even bigger risk to make an avalanche. And it doesn't make any point because that's the peak. I need to go down anyway. I think I spent like half an hour, 20 minutes or something there and thinking and being afraid to move because I know that if I move, there's a big risk that no matter what I do, there will be avalanche because I could see that, you know, there was like carved out snow. So what I decided, all right, um, there was a lot of thoughts about my childhood, my mother, my father, the life and it was those moments where you sort of start to think about your death because I was getting certain that I'm gonna die. And um, so let me let me just can, let me just re let me just back can... up real quick, Max. So this is <laughs> this is some kind of let me. Are you a religious person at all? Not really. I, I would love to be, but I'm not. So all of a sudden, you're 19 years old. You hop on a train, you take the first train, from the train you take a bus, another mm -hmm. three, four hundred miles, you see this gorgeous mountain, and you say to yourself, something internally is telling me, I need to go climb that. Yeah. You go rent some skis. You have, yeah. you're not really prepared for this, right? I <laughs> know, by no means. I've never climbed a mountain before. And then you go up this mountain, and we're... Did you create the avalanche, or was it just nature that created the avalanche? That's a question. I don't know. I was just climbing. You know, uh, obviously it was me doing the act because without it, the, the, the avalanche would not have launched because it was just leaving just below me. So I could see the starting point. It was just, you know, half a meter from me. So, uh, um, but to make the long story short... I mean, the book is, by the way, it's already Amazon bestseller. So, um, Journeys to Success and great stories. But the long story short is that when I started to climb down, um, there was three or four, maybe five avalanches, which just started because of me, just below me. And uh, every time when this happened, I was certain that, if it wasn't this one, I'm going to die. It's going to be the next one. So every move I made, I knew that there's a, in my head, it was a greater chance to die than to live. 
And those kind of moments when it's this prolonged uh, experience of you're going to die now and you can still stop it because if I don't move, if I freeze here, there was no people around. I could not call. My mobile phone didn't work. Anything, there was no connection to the mm. So if I move and I need to move, so I'm going to die. There's a bigger chance I'm going to die. So that was a moment where I realized that I have lived my life not to the fullest. So I found out that I was just a boy playing with life and I needed to gain, I needed to live the life. It wasn't about the wisdom then, it wasn't anything specific, but when I get down to the tree level where there wasn't any more risk for avalanche, I cried, not because I survived, but because I cried that I'd given the chance to live my life. So I was happy to be alive and to actually live the life. What, and yes. What what I were mean, you doing it's, it's, but what were you doing yeah. before? What were you and I mean, were you I don't know, were you robbing banks? Were you uh, dealing drugs? <laughs> I mean I, <laughs> So I mean you you know, again, I've seen your content on LinkedIn, and I, I'm I'm kind of guessing here, Max, that you weren't a uh, a criminal of any sort. But what what was it in your early teen years that you felt that you weren't being a good person? You weren't living the life that you were put on this planet for. I haven't really felt like I, you know, I I don't have this. Um, I don't have a moral obligation in that way for myself that I feel that I'm a bad, ever been really bad person. I see myself always being a good person. I haven't really done anything. I never harmed other people or done anything wrong in my eyes. Um, the the when I when I was young and I'm still having this sort of a fire in me that has been always in my life that I'm explorer, you know, not just explorer in a, you know, in a geographical way, but human mind. So I've been always intrigued by people and their behavior and thoughts and ideas and, and uh, sometimes it means to that I need to have a I have, I have built sort of a special set of skills that I use subconsciously with people that I want to sort of reveal themselves and uh, explore with them their true nature and, and maybe grow and become better people with me or without. But for that moment when I'm there, I want to share and I want to explore. So it sounds like, Max, that you just didn't have a, a moral compass, that you were maybe, I mean, it's understandable. You were a young man. You were more uh, into, you know, what are your needs versus what are others' needs. And then, uh, again, uh, you have this awakening on the, on that mountain. And so here you are. What, after, after your... Um, maybe, you know, maybe one way of looking at it too, Max, is maybe that was your mission trip maybe it was just something that you know like you said you're not a very religious person and maybe there was just some type of calling for you to go from uh your town to the train to the bus to the mountain what was the first thing after you came off that mountain after you had that self-realization what was the first thing that um after i'm, I'm guessing you went back home and said, maybe, all right, I've had this wonderful experience. I need to do something about it. So what was the first thing that you can remember that you did after having that experience? Well, I mean, the first thing what I did was, uh, well, I was exhausted, so I just slept. <laughs> I slept like, I mean, 
I slept in the bed and breakfast. I slept in the train. I slept uh, when I get back to my uh, apartment. And um, but I think there was some sort of it was a seed. It wasn't really like big. I'm gonna change the world now, or I'm a better person now. There wasn't really anything about that. It was more about it was a seed planted in my mind that uh, you need to man up. You need to respect your own values. You need to um, you need to define yourself. I mean, that was one of the things that really sort of uh, started. I think there that. I started to define myself, which is still in the process. I mean, we mm-hmm. we evolve all the time, but but it it made me to think that I want to actually not only to live the life to the fullest, but but make a difference. Uh, and and that's a long journey when you sort of start from all the way from there, where where and in my case, what was a and I am still very free so you have a lot of space to explore so the whole exploration is in a way defining still you know even though that i'm more sort of tight now in my existence uh it is still very you know sort of it grows and evolves like we everybody do. I mean, we every every communication, any any contact with our world, we um, we grow hopefully from that. So when you say you're you're tight now, you you your meaning is that you understand now what your purpose is. Uh, I understand much better. Yes. Okay. Yes, but it's it's not it's not like this uh, when I met. Uh, with with uh, with uh, with the monk last night, where he was already there, you know, uh, close to Nirvana. Uh, for me, my existence is still. I'm playing around, you know. This is, in a way, it is very deep desire for me to express myself, but it is also play, because taking things to the certain extreme. You know, it's a happy place because you can actually experiment and you can learn from it. So the high hats and and the whole uh, um, experimenting with life is part of this process still. But I experiment with with within my own rules in a way. So I I don't I don't have this normal limitations where where someone says that no, you can't have a top hat on, or, or you cannot say this, or you cannot do this. I I have my own sort of um, yes, I do have limitations, but they're different. And how does your family react to your uh, your your rules of Maxism? <laughs> the rules of Maxism, uh, very well. I mean, uh, my parents they i think they already from the teenage years they sort of gave up that this guy is uh, not going to be uh, just a regular normal looking guy so uh and from then on i have the liberty just uh, you know they've been you know sort of observers and and so on and uh, my own you know family um with my kids i think they grow with me and i grow with them because kids are open mind, you know, they have open mind, and they are, um, when they see me being me, they know that this is, this is true, authentic. But do they, do they go, oh, dad, you're embarrassing me again, I mean, what, what, what's their reaction? Their reaction is just to play along, because I have learned then that, um, I mean, the younger doesn't really get it yet. He doesn't care. He's only four years. Uh, but the older, six years old, she is already. She knows that I'm a little bit special, you know. And uh, she, she sort of, she has. I have involved her many to my projects, and uh, 
she's already going to be this fantastic person who's not afraid to also to uh, to do to experiment reach out and present to the world in crazy ideas and uh, and um, very creative so um, I mean uh, we, we I try to sort of um, guide them to not to have too many limitations to be to become something what they find maybe later on uh, but I try to give them the tool set to to uh, to actually enjoy the life you know do you um, and 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 I don't know if this is a, an American thing, Max, but or maybe it's a parenting thing. But do you find that, um, and I'm going to say we as you and I, um, do do we find that it's oh how do I phrase it? Trying letting our kids fail is that something difficult that you've seen in others? Or because of your your um, somewhat upbringing after after your uh, we'll call it your nineteen year old uh, new self, do you find it easier now to let your kids fail? I mean, I, I have always, without knowing it, I've been seeking for failures, you know, like mistakes. Mm-hmm. Uh, the whole my adult life, my subconscious has been that I need to reach out to a level where I make mistakes, because then I know that I will grow. Um, that is the only way where you really truly learn. You cannot really you can learn by reading and you can see things being done, but when you do the mistake yourself, you feel it much deeper, and if you handle it correctly in your mind, it is a, just a learning process. And the kids need to fail. I mean, that's the rule number one. You need to allow them to fail, and you should not prohibit them from failing, because that's just you know human nature. This is the only way we learn and grow. Uh, and this is the, in the modern society, uh, especially with adults, is that we have this expectation that we should not fail. It is like things should be perfect. There is no perfection. Perfection is uh, is something ephemeral. It's something there in the clouds when we die, maybe, or something like that. But perfection is doesn't find. We cannot really be perfect here as a human beings, because we are human beings only. We are not gods. And by understanding this, we can actually just to relax and enjoy the process of living. Because by allowing ourselves to fail and not to take this stress of it, you know, but we need to allow to, to say, this was fine, this is good, I failed. What was the lesson here? You know? Um, this is something that, you know, most people are unaware because the social expectation is that you are not allowed to fail. I mean, people mean well. Especially anything, anybody who has authority over you has uh, almost duty to make you not to fail because they love you or they care about you. It is sort of this, oh, uh, like, you know, just do this and everything will be fine kind of thinking. But everything will not be fine because you haven't actually grown, you've been just given instruction. So you become this whole person who is just following instructions, living life because of following another some, someone else's manuscript. Yeah, when I uh, was first teaching my son how to ice skate, I would always tell him, you know what the greatest thing about falling down is? And he'd look at me like I'm, I've got a third eye in my head. And he'd be like, what? And I'd go, getting back up. And that was a little bit of a... a internal mantra that he finally understood and you know when when we would have you know hockey practice and one of the kids would fall down I'd grab my son and say Connor what's the greatest thing about falling down he go getting back up and 
It, it goes back to, like you were saying, Max, there are times where we feel that life is supposed to be perfect. Life is supposed to be successful. But again, you know, especially as, you know, you and I as entrepreneurs and uh, as parents, it you don't learn without failing. You don't learn by not falling down. You you have to constantly be learning. Mm-hmm. And yes, I mean, uh, it, it is it is especially with kids that we should be aware that they don't care about failures. When you see three year old doing stuff, learning to run or play something, or or they don't care. They just keep banging their head into the wall before they recognize, all right, this was stupid. You know, at some point they will realize it and then they have learned it and hopefully they will not do it when they are 13 or 30. So, and it is always individual process. You cannot really force them to say, don't do this. Yes, you can stop them doing it. But as a, as a parent, I think it has sort of taken over hand this whole idea that we protect them from the world. No, they should show the kids to the world and be them, be there for them in the process because the world will be anyway out there. At some point, it will hit hard if they haven't really been, you know, experimenting with it early enough. So that's why I mean, I'm doing crazy stuff. Like, I mean, one of the things what I'm really sort of proud of is that just recently, like two, three months ago, um, we started a new practice at home. I was alone with the kids because my wife was having, wife was having a night off. And um, I told my oldest one that, all right, let's let's uh, let's do yoga, let's do meditation. And uh, I switch off the lights, turn the candle light, put some nice music, and meditation music, and we start to meditate. And the younger one, then three years still, comes and, you know, just sit on my lap and we meditate. Right. So, and I told her, you are the teacher, teach me how to do yoga. And she goes, she does her own movements, but it's like perfection because she doesn't know the normal program. And that by now she has learned so much because she has been now being, you know, she's taken a couple of times a week, you know, like classes from outside. But I mean, that was the moment we have done. Exception has only exception has been when I was in holiday, but otherwise other we've been doing every single night from that on. That she's our teacher, you know, and that is also understanding that my role is not only be the teacher; she can be my teacher, you know. And yoga is so, in a way, it is so primitive and so strong that even the child can, if they have the touch in themselves and understanding they can be and they naturally take the role in themselves so we have a six-year-old yoga teacher who's better than anybody else i have seen to teach yoga that i mean oh my gosh that's brilliant max i mean uh, that i mean that I, I don't know if that's parenting 101 but that's that's just brilliant and it's exactly like you said why do the parents always have to be the teacher We're, we don't i mean we don't know everything, and <laughs> learning from our kids. I mean, it, well, and it's not just learning from our kids, but learning from others. And oh my gosh, I'm uh, I'm stealing that idea from you, Max. Go ahead. All right. You should. I am. Starting it's also, today. It, is, it, is, it takes the tension off from the communication, because you need to sort of become the student. And the person you are giving the right to be the teacher or the or the the mentor or mm-hmm. the the instructor is all of a sudden she has grown, and she's the most natural yoga teacher now. Then I I have taken yoga lessons a lot of them, and now she is the most natural teacher of all because she has sort of taken the the I don't know where it comes, but it's natural is instinctively and also her role that I would have given to her is changing the sort of the whole <clears throat> the whole uh, energy in the house because she has the right and and also to guide us you know and everybody should have this right because we have I mean being a human being we have some 
basic, as long as we can communicate with each other, uh, <clears throat> we know already so much We because it's intuitive, you know. From the moment that we say, oh, well, let's do yoga, she, she changes, you know, her existence in a way. She mm-hmm. becomes calmer. She walks slower. She, um, she has this um, tone and she uses much, uh, you know, less, less words. She looks directly in the eyes in a very passionately, but, but, you know, patiently at the same time. And make sure that, you know, we come, sit down, and she has found out many things. I don't know where she picks up, but she makes us to, you know, go to knees and do this every time now. That started a few weeks ago. Uh, that It's like the uh, when people say namaste. Yeah. 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 And uh, a lot of these things that, you know, we think, all right, I mean, we should just put this in YouTube and... You know, or start pe- inviting people to uh, to take classes with her. You know? <laughs> but but look at the big picture, Max. I mean, look at the self confidence you're raising in in your young daughter, and and how she's like you were talking about her energy because she'll take that energy, and that energy is going to resonate with others that she's going to end up being in contact with. You know, I I kind of kid because you know working on my third book. Um, the premise is uh, advice that, and I have to. I always have to emphasize this, Max. I love my dad. I love my dad to death. He gave me the wackiest advice when my son Connor was born, um, and so I, I've kind of reverse engineered that wacky advice of trying to build, you know, self confidence in in not only my son but um, being a blended family with our other two daughters. And again, going back to your example with your daughter, I mean, oh my gosh, you've you've just given her a life skill, Max, that, you know, she might not totally understand it right now, but as she gets older and she gets somewhat wiser, she's going to be able to take that information that, you know, in in a, in a way that you were teaching her without really teaching her. And she's going to be able to build upon that with her strong inner circle. So I, I commend you, Max, on, on taking a, a simple idea of having your, your children teach you something. And the big picture, again, is going to be a simple little life lesson that she's going to take uh, into adulthood. So that's, I mean, again, that... There, there's a parenting book right there for you, Max. You've got my permission to steal that idea. <laughs> Go ahead. <laughs> I mean, I would be happy to contribute for that. Okay. You know, you, we'll, co- we'll co-write it. We'll write an article, and we can start with the article. Uh, you write the article, and I add something there, and we just, and then we put it out in LinkedIn or make a short ebook or something. There we go. It's, it's I'm completely ready to do that. It will be fun. Um, what other so I'm gonna, I'm gonna... So I promise to be back now to uh, because he's been hanging there on online so um, can we do so that you can you can take this first part as a mm-hmm. first part this call and you can do whatever you want with it but just you know if you can attack me um, and or send me a link mm-hmm. uh, we are completely free hands and uh, we continue all right yeah we got part two part yeah. two. The, yeah, the 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 Max and the Max and Tommy show. Yeah, and we can we can uh, continue this talk. Uh, um, you know, we see how far it takes us. You know. Perfect. Well, we'll we'll play uh, we'll play email, LinkedIn message tag to set up part two. Yeah, we do that. Okay. Excellent. Thank you, Thank Max. You so much. Hey, this was excellent. I mean, normally I don't, you know, share that much. I try to listen, you know, uh, learning to listen. <laughs> well, but it was fun also to share. All right, how I about mean, this? That was a good, I mean, I love to share, you know, especially with this, where I feel that I'm making actually a difference. Because I'm always, you know, like with this Victoria, with with my daughter, that I'm experimenting with her. And sometimes I feel a little bit strange. 
because I had to say, you know, when my wife came back the next evening, I was like, I told, all right, let's do yoga. So like, yeah, well, that's great. But Victoria is the, she's the instructor. What's your daughter's name? Victoria. Victoria. Yeah. So, and it's a strange idea, but it works. You know, it gives a, like you said, she, she has completely taken the role for herself and we are learning from her. So. Yogi Victoria. That's a good title. Yeah. Yeah. We, we, we proceed with that. All right. Yeah. Great. Thank you, Max. Love the hat. Bye. (laughs) Bye. Let's book a time for next, all right? Okay. Bye. Thank you for listening to Blending the Family. Oh, yeah, and we hope you'll come back next time. Please. No, really. Please.